This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here with an old friend and outstanding journalist who's covered economic issues for over 20 years. Peter Goodman is currently the Global Economics Correspondent at the New York Times, and prior to that, in the distant past, was the head of the Shanghai Bureau for the Washington Post. He's got a new book that's an extraordinary, extraordinary Thank you. portrait of our time. It's called Davos Man, How the Millionaires Devoured the World. And it comes out on January 18th, and we're very fortunate for Peter, how do you say, giving us the time to explore his ideas here today. Thanks for joining me, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. It was a great inspiration to me, actually, while I was putting the book together, because you kept teeing up uh, these fantastic, interesting speakers who had all sorts of relevant things to say about many of the subjects I've been diving into in the, in the book. So thanks for having me. Oh, thanks. So let's talk. What inspired you? What, what, was, what was the itch that made you want to scratch by writing this book? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the culmination of things I've been writing about, thinking about now for a quarter century. I mean, going back to uh, writing about China's transformation while I was based in Shanghai, covering the Great Recession in the States, and then going off to be the European economic correspondent in 2016. But it's been triggered, really, by things that have happened more recently, like, you know, Trump becoming president. Brexit happening, uh, something that most uh, of the sort of conventional wisdom thinkers uh, would have said could not have happened. Uh, and, and just the, the clear sign that there's a lot of uh, something other than harmony in a lot of our major economies. There are a lot of very unhappy people with a lot of legitimate grievances that has resulted in uh, leaders uh, taking power, not just Trump, not just the people who delivered Brexit, but, you know, Matteo Salvini becoming a force uh, in, in Italy, the Sweden Democrats, this party with uh, root in the neo-Nazi movement, uh, becoming a mainstream party in Sweden. Uh, you go around the globe, the rise of Bolsonaro in Brazil, Narendra Modi in India, Duterte in the Philippines, signs that something uh, fundamental is shifting in our democracies where uh, suddenly leaders with very unconventional ideas about justice, about identity, about nationalism are, are taking power. Uh, and I, I found myself writing about these transformations uh, in sort of siloed fashion while realizing again and again that they all had something in common. And that was a basic pillaging of uh, public resources. And a lot of people were thinking about economic inequality in connection with what we now call right-wing populism. But a lot of the trends, uh, like uh, the fact that the wealth, a wealthy handful of people in many developed economies were, were monopolizing and increasing uh, the share of the gains of modern capitalism, lots of people were writing that and observing this link. But the tone always seemed to be sort of passive. There was this kind of faceless... Mm -hmm group of beneficiaries. Nobody ever pulled the curtain. And, and, and so th there was this discussion of these massive shifts happening in our societies as if we were discussing weather patterns or worse, as if somehow inequality is just preordained. And, you know, if you want to have vaccines, if you want to have Google, then you've got to have some people losing, you know, at a, uh, at a tremendously, uh, uh, in a tremendously dramatic way. And I found myself time and again dissatisfied by the ex explanation. There is a culprit, and that culprit is a species of humanity uh, I refer to as Davos Man, stealing a name from Samuel Huntington, the political scientist who coined that term back in, in 2004, to refer to what we can now call the billionaire class, people who, who are so wealthy and so powerful that they effectively write the rules for the rest of us, uh, they, they don't feel any particular loyalty to, to any particular ideology or nation uh, or set of conventions. They're really just about uh, perpetuating uh, their own power and adding to their own bottom line. And these are the people who have essentially uh, made modern society and, and democratic governance uh, come to a place of real dysfunction. 
These are the people who have effectively liquidated public infrastructure and given the proceeds to themselves uh, through tax cuts, through tax evasion, who have privatized important parts uh, of government, who've left our governments uh, in a in in a uh, really pitiful state, uh, especially in countries like the the U.S. and the U.K., where these trends are particularly extreme. But even in places like Sweden, where uh, this supposed you know bastion of social democracy, where in the midst of a pandemic, we learn that the public health system has been cut uh, so much that we've essentially sacrificed senior citizens in order to build up herd immunity for everybody else. So you know that's a long-winded way of saying I. I I felt it necessary to focus on the people who are actually responsible for engineering our modern economies uh, to operate in the service of their own bottom line uh, at the expense of everybody else. That's the, the sort of gray matter that explains why so many people are in such a precarious state that they're willing to embrace some extremely unconventional and usually uh, ineffective solutions to very real problems of scarcity. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember a number of books, how would I say, walking up the ladder towards where you're at. Uh, a gentleman named, I think it's David Goodhart, The Road to Somewhere in the UK. Hmm. You mentioned Dead Souls, the denationalization of the American elite, which was the original article. Uh, by Samuel P. Huntington, who uh, right. well, is not considered a left-wing critic or what have you. He was just essentially saying, we've, with globalization, created a place where these people aren't governed by anybody. And they can, which you might call, play in the cracks and the fault lines or arbitrage between cultures. And uh, uh, things have come, come way out of balance in that context. But, uh, I, I'm curious. You know, when I'm listening to you in the introduction, I always hear musical lyrics, and I heard Buffalo Springfield sing, for what it's worth, there's something <laughs> happening here, but what it is ain't exactly right. clear. Uh, there's a man with a gun over there telling me, I got to beware. Hey, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. So right. you're, you're, right. you're, sending us, you're sending us a flare. I mean, you might say it's, it's long overdue, in the way you describe things, but you're sending us a flare of how to look at what you want to call the psychological resistance from ideologies as it relates to people and actual structures. And, you know, Davos Man is borrowed from uh, Samuel Huntington's title. It's symbolic, but you also in the book explore the actual nature of the World Economic Forum in Davos. And I'm curious, uh, right. uh, how, how, how do I say, how you arrived at this title, I think had to be in part influenced by what you saw in your diagnosis was evident in that context. Yeah, that, to be perfectly honest, uh, was accidental initially. I mean, what's become uh, the main thrust of the book didn't start out that way. I mean, initially, mm. I was writing uh, what I thought, I mean, this is pre-pandemic, right? I'm, I'm conceptualizing a book that's about inequality and how in many societies where right-wing populists have taken power, often demonizing immigrants or, you know, demonizing other vulnerable populations as the explanation for why people don't have enough health care, why uh, housing is no longer secure, uh, why uh, people who previously could earn a living with their hands can't anymore uh, without risk of poverty. And, and uh, so I was trying to write, uh, I began by writing this story of, of inequality and right-wing populism, looking at how these right-wing populist opportunists would demonize some other group and capture votes. Uh, this is a playbook, you know, we saw in the United States with Trump. This is uh, to a large degree how, how Brexit ultimately happened. Uh, this is how uh, the right wing got very popular during the time I was writing this book in, in Italy. Uh, and, and then uh, I realized uh, as I went off to Davos in 2017, you know, Brexit at that point uh, was six months into the process. Uh, Trump was uh, about to be inaugurated. And uh, suddenly the founders of the World Economic Forum 
decided that you know they should at least pay lip service to an exploration of populism and inequality. So there were all these panels about uh, how to deal with inequality, and I thought, well, let's let's go sample uh, what's on offer. And I I went to a bunch of different seminars, and for those who've never been to Davos, which I assume is most people, uh, it, it it is officially. A bunch of very earnest seminars on things like gender equality, inequality, uh, threats to uh, the environment, uh, and and this uh, supposed search for solutions, all under this rubric committed to improving the state of the world. Which, if you think about it, gives away the central absurdity of the whole enterprise, because the people who are gathered there are the people responsible for the state of the world. The people who go to Davos could with the blink of an eye, solve all of human problems if there was consensus, you know, right there. But by by gathering under this rubric committed to improving the state of the world, everybody gets to claim that that's what they're actually interested in. So whatever it is they're discussing, whether you, you can have a panel full of uh, pharmaceutical industry executives discussing the inaffordability of drugs as if like, hmm, this is a real head scratcher. Let's try to get to the bottom of this one with everyone uh, engaged in this supposed conversation truly devoted to this as opposed to you know posturing to uh maintain their own uh privileges so at this particular davos in january 2017 i went around to say okay everyone here has come around to the view that uh globalization the system that's made everybody incredibly rich uh is now under threat some wacky things have happened nobody expected to see brexit happen nobody expected to see uh, a multiple bankrupt uh, casino magnate who's threatening to treat uh, the U.S. national debt like the sort of debt that he can renounce as a as a casino magnate. You know, these things are wacky. What, what are we to make of this? Let's try to understand. And as I went around, uh, I heard, you know, explanations, uh, s supposed solutions for inequality that always put the onus on the people who didn't have anything. You know, well, workers have to train themselves. Uh, I heard my former boss, Ariana Huffington, talk about how people need to sleep more. If everyone sleeps more, that will uh, solve our problems. Uh, I listened to Ray Dalio, uh, who at the time I think was worth $17 billion, one of the largest uh, investment managers on earth, talk about how uh, what we needed to do was unleash more animal spirits so that people could uh, feel more incentives to make money, as if a man worth $17 billion somehow... Uh, we don't have enough incentives uh, in the system to, to make money to begin with. That was very odd. What I didn't hear anyone talk about was strengthening the power of labor so workers could negotiate for better wages and working conditions. I didn't hear anybody talk about progressive taxation so that we could actually redistribute some of the wealth uh, from people who have more of it than they could possibly spend in multiple lifetimes to uh, everybody else. And that was uh, very striking. So as I began to conceive of the book, I, I thought, you know, this right here, the gathering of the people who have all the money uh, wanting to lecture us about how we're going to solve this, solve, I put in, in, you know, air quotes, the situation where they have everything, but they're not actually willing to sacrifice uh, because they're, they're interested in win-win solutions where, you know, this kind of mythical idea that the billionaires don't have to sacrifice. The wealthy don't actually have to give anything up, but somehow through talk and the expressing of good intentions, uh, we can uh, achieve some sort of solution to this problem. Uh, that became my way in to the broader story of, about how we got to this place. Uh, and then, then I realized that it, you couldn't simply refer to the billionaire class in composite. We had to have some cases that we could explore so we could get into the life experiences and the psychology and the actions of these incredibly wealthy people who've amassed these fortunes uh, and who have uh, gone to great pains to protect those fortunes and, and build them even while they're giving us lectures about how they actually have our best interests at heart. So I then picked five characters who, uh, who I thought typified this mindset in various ways and gave us exposure to different industries. So I, I, I started with uh, Mark Benioff, who's uh, the CEO of Salesforce, this big software company, who's on the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum, who's taken to saying that CEOs are the heroes of the pandemic, that 
CEOs have saved us. The government hasn't saved us. Uh, I wrote about Jamie Dimon, who, of course, heads J.P. Morgan Chase and who played uh, a central uh, role in um, getting Trump's uh, enormous tax cuts, which have furthered inequality, passed. I wrote about Larry Fink. Uh, who's a, another uh, another CEO like Benioff. He's, he's the head of uh, BlackRock, which is the world's largest uh, asset management firm. Like Benioff talks about this thing called stakeholder capitalism, this idea that we're past the days of Milton Friedman shareholder maximization. Now companies are thinking about uh, social goods. They're thinking about the environment. Uh, they're thinking about local communities uh, and who has along the way uh, managed to uh, amass uh, his his own fortune, along with uh, the power to uh, shape the bailouts that have been spent, uh, not just uh, in the most recent crisis, the pandemic, but previously in the great financial crisis, giving him just tremendous uh, insight into how uh, how the Fed, in particular, really s uh, spends its money, how how it operates. I wrote about uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, who needs no introduction. Uh, but I, I, I've come at Bezos in a, in a different way, I think, than most people who've written about Bezos. I, I look at him as, as a tremendous beneficiary of international trade, as, as the intermediary between factories around the world and consumers in, in the wealthiest markets, especially the United States, but has monopolized the bounty uh, to such a degree that much of the public has turned against trade, which is really a... Uh, a great loss because trade, uh, if we if we run the rest of our economies well, uh, is generally pretty beneficial uh, to, to most people. Well, we we're at a place now, a juncture, where uh, you might, might say we're both looking back and looking forward. We're looking while the pandemic is still here at who's gotten rich from the pandemic and who's suffered. We're looking on the horizon at climate change and the need to organize what you might say for a common good right and uh i would say we also have a need to uh how to say look forward to how despair distorts or impairs democratic politics and makes people we should say vulnerable to the temptations of demagoguery or authoritarian solutions because they don't see any relief on the horizon for their multiple anxieties. Right. So, so I, I think, and I guess I'm a doctor's son, your diagnosis of the operation of what you call the Davos men does shed light on some of the, what you might call depth and persistence of anxiety about future challenges. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, for instance, uh, when I heard you, you were talking about BlackRock and others, uh, you're talking about the, say, the use of private sector systems to vigorously address challenges that some of these people right. would, would say, if you do it to us, it all bogs down if you do it with us or enlist us. Maybe you've got a problem with managing conflicted interests where doing well for themselves and doing well for the system they're asked to invigorate is hard to balance or to monitor or to regulate. But, I, but I'm interested in how you're seeing, given what you've learned, we need to approach this next this next phase, this next chapter. Let's say climate change. I know Mark Carney, right. who's a friend of mine, has talked right. about channeling the $30 trillion capital markets in the direction of addressing climate change. Others, Adair Turner, who's been a, a senior fellow at INET, has talked about the need to engage all of these energy systems companies sure. to deploy renewables around the world. But sure. The question at some level is how do you do that without what you might call excessive exploitation if this system of governance, regulation, and balance is sure. absent and, uh, and may lead to further despair and further lurching toward authoritarian rather than democratic solutions? I mean, 
my intent in writing this book is not to demonize business or billionaires or wealth. Uh, business is full of incredibly intelligent people who know uh, all sorts of important things on a great range of subjects and have a lot of solutions. I mean, there's there's no question of, uh, about that. It's it, it's not that we need to get to a place where you know government is the solution by itself to to all problems. It's that we need to we need to excise this uh, unhealthy thinking that we've adopted as a society and not by accident. I mean, mentalities that have been engineered by Davos man to prevent us from very com commonsensical approaches to business like, you know, simple regulations that ensure that the public is protected against pollution, against the risk of financial crises. Uh, to ensure that there are basic workplace standards such that uh, ordinary rank and file workers don't have to choose between uh, exposure to a deadly virus and a pandemic and, and their and their paychecks. We need to have some rules and those rules that need to be set by the public through democratic means. Uh, but if we do that, you know, if we get the policies in place, there's no reason why government can't then partner uh, with businesses. I mean, I mean, how are you going to there's simply no way that we're going to address climate change without engaging the people who are running the energy sector. They know the nature of the problem. They have the solutions. They have the data. They have the science. But we need to change the incentives. And what we what ultimately I'm arguing in this book is that we need to get over this idea that we can simply entrust uh, billionaires who have built a machine that has been incredibly lucrative for themselves and their shareholders, we need to get over the idea that they're just going to solve our problems through right now it's stakeholder capitalism. You know, this this kind of absurd notion that we can just count on businesses doing the right thing. So therefore, we don't need government to regulate. We don't need labor unions to play a role uh, in, in wage negotiations uh, in ensuring uh, decent uh, workplace conditions. We do need to have government play the role that it played, especially in this country, in the United States, in the period in which uh, the market was, in fact, working most effectively. And that's, you know, 1945 till the middle of the 70s. Now, my book is not an argument that we want to go back in time to the mid 70s. I mean, we had all sorts of problems that uh, we, we've made a lot of progress on. I mean, we're, we're a much more representative society, though by no means are, can we declare victory in terms of race and, and gender. Um, there, there are tremendous class uh, cleavages. I mean, we lived through the, the Vietnam War. We had Jim Crow in that period. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not here to sort of romanticize the post World War Two period. But in one basic way, a time when unions were stronger, when government regulated uh, m much more uh, diligently than it has since uh, on antitrust, uh, on, on labor conditions, you did have a situation where economic growth translated into rising living conditions for just about everybody. Uh, just about every community got their piece of the action in that period. And we need to get back to that in a modern context. And that's not going to happen by waiting for Davos Man to deliver on Davos Man's rhetoric. Davos Man is extremely skilled uh, at expressing empathy. I mean, the whole point of the World Economic Forum is this kind of elaborate virtue signaling for everyone uh, who's a participant. And even if those of us in the audience are not buying it, Davos Man himself is buying it. Davos Man leaves Davos every year uh, more energized in his own goodness and his own ability to, you know, as ben, Benioff's actually written books about this, to, to do do good uh, and, and get rich at the same time. Uh, there's a conflict between the these systems that Davos man is building for his own enrichment, legalizing tax evasion, stripping away regulations, minimizing taxation at the top. I mean, this kind of bottom up income transfer. There is a direct collision between that and the policies that everybody else needs to do the things that are required to make to, to generate economic growth that actually promotes well-being for large numbers of people. That involves investing in public infrastructure that involves making health care housing, education, more affordable. And there are no win-win solutions. Some people are going to have to give something up. 
the people at the top are going to have to give something up. And they're simply not going to do it of their own volition. It's going to require an exercise in democracy. Yeah, let me ask you a question about that, the exercise in democracy, because I know I have a group at INET called the Commission on Global Economic Transformation that Michael Spence and Joe Stiglitz co-chair. Yeah. And they're working on five different reports related to what I'll call disruptors, climate, technology, uh, globalization, the, a disruptor of governance, which is what we'll come back to, finance, and migration. In the question of governance, as I've listened to these experts, there are about 22 of them on this commission talking about it, there's this notion which is local governance is tangible. It's like if a guy says to you, how can I get, you, if you've got a local councilman, you say, how can I get my driver's license renewed? He can help you. Right. Global governance, it has everything under the tent that can affect you, but it's a long way away from you. Local governments may diagnose the maladies, but not have any control over the things that are damaging your life. So yeah. when you talk about democracy, I feel like we're in a place where people who are skillful and not necessarily uh, well-being, whether consciously or unconsciously, can arbitrage between societies. And I think globalization with its high-speed technology financial transfer has strengthened the bargaining power of capital and technology and financial For capital sure. and weakened people because the resistance to human migration, particularly among the lower educated, is quite formidable. And so how do we, how do we get the kind of governance of the whole system that is both responsive and equitable, but acknowledges this global platform? I mean, this is the ultimate question. Uh, and unfortunately, there are no uh, enormously satisfying answers beyond uh, people have got to uh, organize around educating uh, their fellow citizens on the real root causes of our, our problems. Uh, it, it, you know, how do you reform a system that is effectively controlled by the people who benefit from the system? That's really what we're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you take a system that's been where the rules have been written by Davos man to promote the interests of Davos man to protect Davos man from things like antitrust enforcement and taxation? And how do you use that very system that Davos man basically controls to make Davos man pay his fair share so the rest of us uh, can uh, send our kids to college and go see a doctor when we're sick without taking out second mortgages on our homes, if we even have homes. Uh, that, that's, that's really the question that we're asking. You know, all, all we can say is that, I mean, in terms of our own history, in terms of American history, uh, our history is full of people who didn't seem to have any power uh, finding in uh, the Constitution in uh, favorable uh, platforms for organizing, you know, ways of securing rights for themselves. And that now has to be done on a, on a grand scale because the status quo seems to be that every time there's a crisis, and we've now lived through two very profound crises in a, in a short period of time. And we've lived through the great financial crisis uh, of 2008, which turned into the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, uh, and uh, the Great Recession in the U.S., which went on you know, a long time uh, and has left a lot of people nursing very real grievances about how little they got as they watched uh, billionaires get bailed out. And now we, we're, we're living through the, the pandemic. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, we get a lot of rhetoric around, oh, we need change. We need a fundamental refashioning. Uh, we need policies that will protect ordinary people instead of simply the the one tenth of the one percent. Uh, but there's there's a system that, you know, here we are. I'm tempted to now speak in the passive voice, which is what what we seem to default. No, the system replicates itself or no. What happens is Davos, man. I mean, the phrase I use to describe the billionaires who actually write the rules, they've got lobbyists that no one else can dream of. You know, I mean, 
people mm-hmm. who need help with childcare so they can get go get to work, uh, they don't have lobbyists. Uh, people who who are uh, defending themselves against eviction in a pandemic that was not of their own making, where their job is now uh, gone, not through any uh, a bad behavior on their part, but because they happen to be unlucky to live in this moment of time, they generally don't have lobbyists. You know, Amazon has 100 plus lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Uh, Davos Man has the apparatus uh, that is designed to maintain the status quo and make it sweeter. And that's what happened after the global financial crisis. That's what's happening now. And the only solution to that uh, is for the people to use the only strength the people have, and that's numbers. Now, Davos Man is very skilled at dividing and conquering, you know, making sure that uh, somebody is aggrieved uh, uh, about something uh, that that implicates someone other than the billionaires who've managed to uh, pillage the, the public infrastructure. Uh, we're, we're always talking about, you know, we're always angry about some seemingly local issue that comes down to values. Again, this is not by accident. I mean, the the worst media in our midst uh, is is about you know getting clicks by demonizing somebody, by making us afraid of crime, uh, by uh, blaming uh, big government. Uh, also, not accidental. I mean, the, the whole concept of big government financed by big business to protect itself from regulations, to get out from under regulations. And, and, you know, we fall for it because the people, Davos man, doing this to us are very skilled in their use of, of, of a formidable toolkit. The only, the only way uh, that gets undone is, is for people to use the democracy that's there. I, I'm, not, I'm not looking at this through rose-colored glasses. I'm not saying that's simple. I'm not saying that's around the corner. But that's the only way out of this. Yeah. Well, at some level using the democratic process, not necessarily the democracy that is there. And here's the distinction I would make. Yeah, that's a good point. There are a whole lot of people, let's say, from the Biden administration, in the, I'll just focus on the United States for a moment, who wanted to alleviate suffering. But their survival, whether it's in the House or the Senate or the future White House or whatever, depends upon raising money. And so right. the question is, would they rather go for it and run the risk of getting bounced out in primaries or what have you by deep-pocketed counterforces? Or do they want to survive and see if they can edge their way towards something, albeit not satisfying enough to create a change from the existing design to the one you might envision? I think th- this is what I think is one of the most difficult dilemmas, is how do we evolve democracy back into a healthier place when there is so much concentrated wealth and there's so much use for money in politics in thwarting right. those reforms. I think it's, it's, it's a very uh, painful thing to consider. And I think on the if we don't consider it, the prolonged despair leads to well, I mean, the I further the begin- wreckage of so, the system. Sorry, Rob. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it leads to the further wreckage of the system, a despondency, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, the lurch toward authoritarian solution, because right. at least the authoritarian says the system is rigged, there's something wrong. Not that they're going to fix right. it, but they do diagnose yeah. it. I mean, I think what Trump taught us in the U.S. is there's a tremendous power in uh, people who have suffered a degradation of their living standards, hearing someone talk about that and identify a cause of that, even if that cause is bogus. Uh, There's a tremendous power, you know, the old cliche, like everybody just wants to be heard. I think there's a lot of truth to that in society. I think I think a lot of people now, most of us have have been living in a society where uh, we have good reason to think the people in charge are not looking out for us are not thinking about our well-being they're thinking about something else they're thinking about uh, the well-being of their donors if they're in if they hold public office Uh, they're thinking about their own companies and their own shareholders Uh, we've now i mean the pandemic more than probably anything we've ever lived through is is a sign that we can't just assume that there's the system that's just going to take care of what needs to be taken care of that's that's just clearly fatuous. And so uh, 
given that, the political apparatus, which is very sophisticated, uh, has figured out how to uh, find someone who uh, can be blamed, whether it's you know China and the trade deficit, or it's and, and not not by the way to dismiss the idea that China is a significant economic problem. China is a big is a significant economic problem, but the mm -hmm. the solutions to that problem have been simplistic and in many cases have actually hurt uh, the interests of the people who are supposedly uh, set to be helped. Uh, and and it, it, the first step in this process of reclaiming a kind of democracy that could work is to at least lose these false binary ideas that mm -hmm. Davos man has imposed upon us. So, you know, take vaccines, right? I think I think the average person is grateful that Pfizer and Moderna in the U.S. Uh, have cooked up these uh, life saving concoctions that have clearly worked dramatically. They've cut mm -hmm. hospitalization rates, cut the death rates. They're incredible. But along the way, Many of us have internalized this idea, not an accidental idea, an idea uh, imposed upon us by the billionaires uh, who run the pharmaceutical industry, that we can either have these vaccines and accept that there's going to be tremendous inequality with, you know, the situation we're now in, where you have frontline medical workers in parts of Africa going off to hospitals to uh, treat COVID patients with no protection whatsoever while we're talking about booster shots for our children in the United States. Uh, you can either have that, that's just how it's going to be, or we might as well live in caves, uh, just, you know, praying to the gods to save us uh, from this pandemic. This is nonsense, right? I mean, the, the vaccines that we have, and a lot, actually, Ina has done a lot of very good research on this, has done a lot of very valuable research. The vaccines we have are the result, by and large, of publicly financed research. Uh, in the Moderna case, uh, the intellectual property itself is owned by the taxpayer, and we have tremendous capacity to to both have vaccines and dictate how those vaccines are distributed. Now, mm -hmm. what we've lived through is Davos man distributing the vaccines to people who can pay. And so if you live in a country like the U.S. or the U.K. or Germany or Switzerland and, or Japan, and your government is willing to write a giant check to Pfizer and Moderna, and the other pharmaceutical companies that have developed vaccines, then you have protection. And if you live in Nigeria, then you don't have protection. That is the world that we're living in. And it that has happened because we have accepted, not merely accepted, we have been sold by the pharmaceutical industry on this idea that it's an all or nothing proposition. You either accept the inequality, you accept the monopolizing of the returns, or you go without. And that's just demonstrably nonsense. I mean, we've lived through uh, many periods in our history. Uh, take, you know, the end of the HIV uh, uh, d debate over intellectual property, where the pharmaceutical in companies can make out just fine. No problem with pharmaceutical executives driving off to their beach houses in their Audis. That's all well and good. The shareholders can make a nice return. And we can still get life-saving medicines eventually, far too late, but eventually... Uh, into the bloodstreams of people who need them. And that basic reality uh, needs to be explored in finance, in housing, in healthcare, in education. We need to understand that we have a lot more choices beyond the status quo where a handful of people benefit and a lot of people suffer, uh, but at least we have the fruits of modern capitalism or we're Venezuela. That is just a false binary that Davos man has, has sold us. And it's, it's really polluted uh, our sense of governance and our sense of what is possible. Mm. One of the things I find, uh, how do you say, makes me shake my head is when people talk about fiscal prudence, meaning not letting the deficits run out of control because it leads to what you might call uh, future tax liabilities or what have you. And then they want to let the dissemination of these vaccines that, as you mentioned rightfully, the uh, taxpayer largely paid for the R&D, though, you know, there's value added coming from many dimensions. Sure. But the idea that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be really silly here, that we don't go to the pharma executive and say, we'll double your profit. 
and then disseminate all over the world. So we stop variants from happening. We stop having a second and a third and a fourth shutdown and all of the fiscal compensate. We would save trillions by spending billions if we would just right. acknowledge what the playing field really looks like. Yeah, and, I, I think that's true. Though I, I think there's also some credence to the idea that this, this pandemic is probably not a one-off. Yeah. Uh, and the people in Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Bolivia, you know, who are still waiting for what COVAX was supposed to deliver, I right. have every reason to say, well, I, we don't particularly feel like waiting for our for, former colonial masters to show up all generously uh, with the goods. We need to build up our own productive capacity. Uh, and that's going to involve some some help with the intellectual property, with technology mm -hmm. transfers. And that's not going to happen because, you know, Pfizer and their CEO, uh, Albert Borla, you know, signs the business roundtable stakeholder capitalism pledge that says we're not just running our company for the interests of our shareholder. We're now thinking about society. That's just we, we can't put stock in that. We yeah, we need right. rules. And maybe it's at the, at the World Trade Organization. Uh, maybe it's it's the U.S. government uh, joining with the U.K. government, the, Ger the European Union. Uh, but we need something that's going to allow this process to happen beyond just waiting for the goodness of the corporations to come yeah. and save us. But I think by what you might call tolerating powerful ability, what I'll call plutocratic ability to influence the rules, regulations, and possibilities, and influence the false consciousness with ideologies, we're actually costing ourselves lives and money. Uh, well, there are, but who's un the there are unnecessary losses. Well, well, who is we? It's yeah. that malfunctioning system. It's not the public at large who are disenfranchised. There's, there's no question. I mean, I get into this directly in, in, in the book that uh, the failure to distribute vaccines globally. I mean, it's not just about humanitarian impulses. If that, if, if it's not enough to think that, you know, we ought to be making sure that doctors in front in in, uh, in developing countries have access to vaccines when they go treat COVID patients. But if that's not enough. Yeah, that's absolutely right. How did we get Omicron? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I was writing stories and I was hardly alone a, a year ago uh, saying that the the impact of this lopsided distribution of vaccines could very well be that we get variants and the variants are, are going to shut down business, not just in the places where they first pop up. They're going to shut down uh, business everywhere. Now, if you're uh, if you're Mark Benioff uh, and you're selling uh, software uh, that allows people to work from everywhere, maybe there's actually a net benefit. And and let me be careful and say, I'm not saying that Mark Benioff is rooting for variants or happy about this, but certainly his company is a beneficiary. Amazon is certainly going to uh, reinforce its hold on e-commerce if more of us are stuck at home and don't feel like going to the shopping mall or the, or the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, there are beneficiaries in this. Moreover, every time there's a bailout, uh, Davos man manages to uh, unleash lobbyists to make sure that a, a lot of the bailout functions as a kind of corporate welfare system for his own interests. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we is a complicated word when you're discussing Davos man, because right. uh, Davos man owns uh, his own islands, his own planes, uh, lives in the ultimate sort of gated community. And as long as money's moving around somewhere, Davos man is going to get a cut, whereas it's we, the vast majority of, uh, you know, the rest of humanity that will suffer as the pandemic goes on. Yeah. Yeah. But I, what I was trying to suggest, and I perhaps didn't do it well, is it's not a zero sum game. It's a negative sum game that the losses right. from adhering to Davos man's design are much greater than the benefits of doing it right and then paying them a little extra on the side even if that's what yeah, we had I, to I do to bribe right. them to unlock a healthier design, we're not doing that. And I, I'm very, very concerned on the scale of the pandemic, coming back to the theme that I've emphasized over and over, when people see something of this import, meaning the pandemic, and they see us failing, it diminishes further their faith and trust in the capacity of governance, social organization, and makes the temptation of authoritarian alternatives even stronger. Yeah, I think that's right. Or, or even just misinformation. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think it's fair to say that part of the reason why vaccination rates are so low in the United States is, is that 
for your lots kids. of people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to your point, I mean, if if you yeah. live in a system where your needs have clearly not weighed in uh, very heavily in the decision making uh, in, in terms of policies, then, you know, suddenly you're supposed to believe that the people running the system have have your best interests at heart and deciding to take a vaccine that's that's uh, that's been clear just for emergency use. Now, let me be careful. I, I don't I don't want to feed, you know, anti-vaxxer lines. I mean, it seems pretty clear the vaccines have, have had a tremendously beneficial effect. And if you you get vaccinated, your risk of dying or ending up even ending up in a hospital uh, get reduced dramatically. We all should be taking these vaccines. Uh, but it's not it's not difficult to imagine how someone who has seen their uh, low skill job uh, shipped out overseas uh, so that somebody working for a fraction of their wages can take that job, who's gotten very little help while they've been out of work, uh, who watched uh, the powers that be uh, bail out the bankers after the 2008 financial crisis while doing little to nothing uh, for average homeowners or people threatened with eviction, would look at this and say, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know what to think, but I don't have a whole lot of faith in the people running the system. And that's not that can be expressed all sorts of ways. One of them uh, can be to lead somebody to anti-vaxxer, clickbait, uh, propaganda. Uh, mm -hmm. And that does seem to be uh, what's happened. And that that certainly applies double in terms of climate change, uh, in terms of, you know, the biggest mm -hmm. challenges of our time which are not, you know, win-win. I mean, somebody's got to, I mean, e even if we can accept, and, and, and I think we should, that in dealing with climate change, we're going to need a lot of public and private investment. That's going to create an awful lot of jobs if we do it right. Some jobs are going to be lost. And so you can understand how uh, somebody who in the immediate term, uh, a coal miner uh, who, whose job is, is on the line in the face of climate change, isn't open to, uh, a conversation around uh, a, a sort of system-wide transition underway because they simply don't trust the, that, that, that there's a process uh, at which their needs uh, weigh in uh, much, if at all. Because, mm -hmm. again, we all know it in our, in, 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 our, in our gut. I mean, this system has been built by Davos Man for the benefit of Davos Man. And, and, and the realization of that... Uh, does not lead toward uh, cooperation. It doesn't lead toward clear thinking. And it opens the door to all sorts of nefarious interests, the clickbait merchants, the political opportunists who, who want to have us fear something or someone to get our vote while then doing nothing or even harming us you know, along, along the way. Uh, it leads to more of the same. That, that, that is our fundamental problem. Yeah. Let me... Uh... Look back at, at the introduction I mentioned that you used to be a journalist in Shanghai. Right. And I'm looking at a world right now, and I'll, I'll quote my friend, or I won't quote, I'll, how do I say, paraphrase my friend Orville Schell. Yeah. He wrote a book with John Dubarry called uh, Wealth and Power. In the book, he said, you have China, which suffered from the opium wars and the Japanese invasion on a pathway to regain its national dignity. And you have the United States, which has led the world system since World War II, but is smaller in numbers of people and so forth than China as China's developing. You have a Western system, what Zbigniew Brzezinski used to call the, uh, in, the Cartesian Enlightenment system, and you have an Eastern philosophical system we might call Taoist that governs China. So you have tectonic plates between who believes they should be in control or is there a changing of the guard. You have philosophical differences. You have a wounded rising country from the hands of the West in China. Right. And you have this world that you're talking about, social media, whatever, clickbait, demonization. We see it in the demonization of race in the United States, in right. the places where everybody's suffering, maybe because of automation or machine learning or other causes. The fights between black and white break out and the ability to make coherent school systems in heterogeneous parts of the community 
fall apart. But the U.S.-China thing is now moving to center stage. And the right. tensions, whether it's related to the Taiwan Straits or whether it's related to the need for collaboration in climate, how are, how are we going to put China and the U.S. together? I mean, I've seen some of your Davos men have been trying to build in China, even in recent months. Uh, others are probably making a lot of money from having built there and avoiding whether it's labor or environmental restrictions. Others talk about how the uplift of the average living standard in China over the last 40 years is miraculous. But how do we, how do we build this governance across these tensions, these philosophical differences and fault line? You've been in China. How do you see that scenario playing out? Well, you know, I was in China uh, from uh, roughly 2001 to 2006 at a time when businesses were still inclined to sell the uh, almost comically absurd notion that uh, increased trade would inevitably lead to pressures for democratization in China. Mm. And, you know, I think, I mean, to answer your question, like in, in, in terms of in terms of the work that we need to do uh, outside of China, we need to disabuse ourselves of the fairy tales that have guided uh, our, our, our policies, I mean, particularly U.S.-China policy. Uh, and again, not by accident, because for Davos Man, China was uh, central to the profit-making equation. I mean, China was ultimately... A, allowed into the World Trade Organization in 2001 and got access to uh, to markets around the globe because uh, Davos men like Jeff Bezos uh, found that and, and eventually Steve Schwartzman, who's a, a character in my book, uh, who's uh, been engaged in all sorts of uh, financial and, and real estate dealings in China, uh, Larry Fink now. Uh, setting up uh, mutual funds, you know, from from the from the beginning. I mean, if you go back now more than 20 years, uh, China was the ultimate way for companies that were organized around enriching shareholders, often by reducing costs to make their stuff uh, much more cheaply than they ever could uh, in their home countries. And then ultimately to sell into a country of 1.3, 1.4 billion consumers, making it uh, the world's largest potential consumer market for damn near everything. Uh, and and that was the pressure. I mean, what, what China's WTO entry was really about was opening up this great frontier, not only for sales, but eventually for investment as Chinese uh, uh, financial entities would take uh, the money they were earning by selling stuff uh, to Americans, Europeans, and then plowing it into productive uh, enterprises for Davos men like Steve Schwartzman, you know, who sold uh, all who sold real estate in, in New York uh, to, to Chinese interests. It was it was never about how it was packaged, right? What the public was told by people I refer to as Davos men enablers, like Bill Clinton. Uh, like Larry Summers, uh, his Treasury Secretary in the U.S., was that this wasn't really about business. It was about democracy. It was about civil liberties. If we engage with China, uh, then uh, Chinese consumer class uh, will develop uh, demand not just for our Gucci handbags and our Hollywood movies and our Coca-Cola, but also for democracy. Uh, and, and there was clear uh, evidence that that was not happening. And yet uh, that, in fact, the reverse was happening, that, in fact, engagement between China and the West was changing Western companies more than it was changing China. Mm -hmm. So, you know, J.P. Morgan uh, got caught uh, basically handing out internships uh, to the powerful uh, to the children of powerful uh, Chinese Communist Party officials. And, you know, guess what? Those officials then developed a taste for J.P. Morgan uh, investment banking services. Uh, Steve Schwartzman runs this Schwartzman Scholars Program, which brings uh, uh, high-level students from around the world to Tsinghua University, which is this very prestigious campus uh, in, in Beijing. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party selects its own candidates, and through this exchange, uh, we're supposed to get you know, mutual understanding. Yeah, I'm sure some of that happens, but a lot of deal-making happens uh, as a result. 
that was always what the game was about. Uh, mm -hmm. And now that we have clear evidence that the Chinese Communist Party has taken a, you know, a dramatic turn toward the authoritarian, uh, there's much less uh, of a healthy civil society than there was when I was there uh, 15 years ago. Dissent is stamped out dramatically. We've seen the treatment of the Uyghurs, this ethnic minority in the western province of, of Xinjiang, who've been uh, housed in concentration camps. I mean, it, the word genocide uh, is now commonly mm -hmm. used to describe uh, what they've suffered. And it's, it's, it's impossible to cling to this idea that by engaging in trade with the West, China uh, would become democratic. So what we're left with uh, is a knowledge that China is vital mm. for the solution of any global problem. You cannot address climate change. You simply cannot address uh, questions around uh, financial stability. You can't address questions of uh, national security in uh, the shipping lanes around the world. You can't address the supply chain chaos that we're living through without a, a real relationship with China. But that relationship has to be based on the genuine interests of the people in the societies that are engaging with China and not the handful of people, Davos man, uh, that has uh, previously monopolized the conversation and set the policy for everyone. Now, I recall in your book, uh, you paint portraits going to the actual Davos World Economic Forum of what it was like when Donald Trump gave a keynote speech as a new president and also a little bit later in time as Xi Jinping uh, presented a right. vision of what he was to the Western society that was, you know, perhaps I, I won't take apart Klaus Schwab, He's a host, and you've got to be right. gracious to the people who agree to come to your be your keynote speakers. On the other hand, neither of those men was particularly subject to debate then or after. As a result, I mean, I mean, Klaus Schwab actually praised Donald Trump the last time Trump was in Davos for building an inclusive American society. I mean, he actually used the word inclusive, uh, and he. Uh, at one point said, you know, we know that you're the subject, I'm paraphrasing now, of, of, a, of a series of misunderstandings. So it's good to hear from you personally. I mean, mm -hmm. as if writing off, you know, all of the investigations, the allegations of impropriety, uh, the uh, clearly uh, allying himself with white supremacist organizations, saying horribly misogynist and racist things, as if these are just sort of misunderstandings. You know, misreported by the scribbling class, people like myself. I mean, that's 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 a lot more than just graciously uh, welcoming your host. He he uh, he praised Xi Jinping when he was in Davos in 2017. Uh, described him as you know, again, I'm paraphrasing, uh, bearing the responsibilities of his nation as if he had somehow been chosen through some election. Uh, no Chinese leader in in our lifetime uh, has been chosen in a in a popular. Uh, election, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, Xi Jinping it is incredibly important and a, a figure that we have to engage with, again, if we're, if we're to solve any of our problems. But let's let, let's be honest about what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an authoritarian who rules under a one party system, uh, who's uh, sent a lot of people to concentration camps along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I was there during the uh, the Donald Trump speech. Uh, our, our mutual friends, Joe and Anya Stiglitz, were in the audience right. with me, and they were quite unsettled. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, how to, trying to calm everything down, you know, after uh, Trump was affirmed in, in the ways that you described. But, you, you know, what I found so interesting, though, about Trump's appearance was that the conventional wisdom, I mean, if, if you sort of chatted with... Um, other journalists well what are you writing and mm -hmm. to read the coverage you got the sense that davos the world economic forum was aghast that trump was showing up because trump represents an attack on globalization an attack on democratic governance uh, mm. uh, a trend mm. toward authoritarianism and nationalism and and misogyny etc uh, as if everyone at davos would be so horrified and what was so interesting about being there was to see that that was, of course, not true. I mean, the people in Davos who matter the most are are the people who run giant consulting companies and tech companies and finance companies. Uh, Davos, man. And, you know, let me tell you, you've been to Davos uh, 
a lot more than I have been. I mean, I, I've, I've been going there for a decade. And if there's one thing that uh, we can clearly say about Davos Man, is that Davos Man doesn't really believe in any ideology, uh, any particular model. Davos Man believes in whatever is required to get the next deal done, to mm. get the policies, mm. to, to be beneficial toward his own interests. And in this particular case, Davos Man understood Donald Trump, we may not like the packaging. We may not like uh, the crude remarks that he makes. Uh, we may not like that he's threatening to uh, just walk away from the American national debt, which could send titters through the marketplace. But we get that he's going to give us tax cuts and deregulation. And those are the things that we actually care about. That's yeah. the stuff that's bankable. And so as you wandered around Davos, then uh, you would have these moments uh, where uh, people would just own up to that and <laughs> it was it was very clarifying and mm -hmm. it, it brought into stark relief the nature of the that the world economic forum plays in all this it's this place where you're simply being there signals your commitment to improving the state of the world your virtues that you're for stakeholder capitalism which is really a kind of way of bending off change while you're doubling down on the status quo and in this case expanding into this new frontier of deregulation and tax cutting. Davos man was very happy to have Donald Trump around and tuned out all of the stuff about trade, all of the stuff about globalization, all of the footsie with the white supremacists. Just tune that out as that's just some sort of reality television show that he's running. We're, we like the money that we're getting. Mm. Yeah, I, agree. I think uh, it's uh, an article in the New Yorker by a mutual friend of ours, Seven Osnos, about how oh, Greenwich, yeah. Greenwich, Connecticut, where I lived for 15 years, how did Greenwich, Connecticut come to like Donald Trump? I think was, I'm paraphrasing the title, but it was essentially the same kind of process in Greenwich as you describe among Davos men becoming acclimated to Trump or ignoring the side effects as long as the deal was sweeter for them. Yeah, that was one of Evan's best pieces of work. And I'm, I'm, I'm an Evan fan. He's, yeah. he's, his greatest hits album is, is chock full. But that, that, that was a very good piece. That, yeah. that landed, actually, as I was writing the book. And, and I, I, I found it uh, very interesting to chew on. Yeah. Well, it, it is, I, how do you say, engage with correlates to your book. Uh, one of our mutual friends, David Sirota, and my former partner in documentary filmmaking, Alex Gibney, have recently made a very, very powerful podcast that's about eight hours long. It's free on Audible, and it's called Meltdown. Right. And it comes to the place where it explores, and the, what do you call it, General Inspector Borofsky from TARP. Right. Right. The overseer yeah. of TARP. Neil Borofsky. Right. Neil, Neil gives a very strong portrait and picture, as do others, of a demoralized America because of how the great financial crisis resolution was handled for the Davos men, not for the people who held mortgages or for the public in general. So, as Joe Stiglitz said, the polluters got paid. Right. And people like Steve Bannon said, and this is what brought you Donald Trump. And uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that I, I'm also a fan of that podcast. And I think the work they do on people who are victimized by the foreclosure disaster and the failure of the federal government to change anything uh, for people who are caught in harm's way. Often, you know, you know there's this whole mythology around uh, the housing disaster in the U.S. that it was all about, you know, people using their houses like ATM machines to get taking home equity yeah. lines of credit so they could uh, take trips to Tahiti. You know, of course, there was some of that uh, in, in any uh, crisis, in, 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 in any bonanza, in any gold rush, there are going to be some mm -hmm. opportunists that, that way. Uh, but an awful lot of people were just caught up in the reality of, of the American economy. I mean, if you you had kids who were of school age and you lived in San Diego or Miami in the years in which housing prices were going up exponentially, society was saying to you, you've got to live in a good school district or you're not doing right by your kids. And to, man, 
building this apparatus. You know, Larry Fink actually was a pioneer of the mortgage-backed security, and the mortgage-backed security became this way for Davos man to gamble on the market with the rest of us living in mm -hmm. the assets that Davos man was trading. And to see it all crash and, then, and to then see uh, investors at AIG, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, made whole while regular people basically got nothing uh, except for a bunch of moralistic lectures about how they shouldn't have signed on the dotted line. That was truly galling. And yeah, Sirota and Gibney really bring that home in yeah. Meltdown. And the result of that was a lot of unhappiness that's with us still and that continues to color our inability to, uh, to achieve anything close to useful policies on a great range of subjects. Yeah, well, I would say just as this is from my own lens, having at one time been the chief economist of the U.S. Senate Banking Committee at the time of the savings and loan crisis, as I watched that unfolding, I was, I was very concerned at how the American people were going to react and the organization that's sponsoring this podcast, INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, was really founded in the aftermath of TARP and the fear of how, which you might call faith in authority, with not just the financial sector, would, would damage society. And what ended up happening is instead of it being what you might say, we patched up finance and some academics did a little different work, which they all did, the spawning of the Tea Party on the right, Occupy on the left, and everything else, trust and faith and expertise deteriorated across many areas, including medical science, right. et cetera, and, and regaining in complex systems some kind of faith right. in expertise and trust in expertise that represents the common good i think is a very big part of our task but it but the as gibney and sirota show us the great financial crisis was a real detonator of right. loss of trust and faith and expertise well, i agree and one of the things i try to do in, in my book is, is uh, show that this is very much a global phenomenon so Mm -hmm. Take the UK, where I was living when I was writing and reporting uh, much, of, much of the book. Uh, I went up to um, uh, a city called Sunderland in the northeast of England, where the largest employer is Nissan. And Nissan um, it was employing about 6,000 people making cars for export around Europe. And so long as Britain was part of the European Union, those cars could be sold across Europe as if they'd been made in Spain or Germany or wherever. It was just one common market. So I went up there uh, to try to understand how a majority of people in this city had voted for Brexit. They had essentially voted directly against their economic self-interest. They had jeopardized the jobs at the largest employer in the city. And I asked a bunch of people this question. I got a bunch of answers. And the most honest answer I got was, and Far, sorry for the foreign correspondent cliche from a taxi driver who said, listen, most of us, we didn't understand what the European Union was, what the common market was. We didn't know about any of that. What we knew was that going back to Margaret Thatcher in the 80s, who was the enemy of working people here, who attacked labor unions, who dismantled manufacturing, who shut down coal mines, we knew that her party the Tory party, the conservatives, they weren't interested in us. And then we watched after the financial crisis, George Osborne, who was the uh, chancellor of the exchequer, essentially the treasury mm -hmm. secretary for Britain, imposed this crippling austerity on us where social services got cut to the bone, where unemployment goes up. And now fast forward, George Osborne and his prime minister, David Cameron, same party as Maggie Thatcher, come up here and they ask us, you know, you got to vote with us against Brexit. Well, he used more colorful language than I'll use on your podcast. But, you know, we, we didn't know what the hell to make of this, but we sure as hell knew we weren't voting for those people. So we voted the other way. That's what happened. And I mean, to your point, if people don't trust the authorities, thinking becomes tribal. Well, I'm not for those people, so I'm for this other thing, even mm -hmm. if this other thing involves, in the case of Britain, severing ourselves from our largest trading partner, uh, for no apparent reason beyond feeling good about shutting the borders to immigrants. Uh, even if it, if it involves, uh, in the case of the U.S., uh, voting for someone 
who brings us into a disastrous trade, trade war with China, which has actually weakened our ability uh, to uh, not only uh, run manufacturing in, in our country because we're, we, there are a lot more people who buy steel and work at companies that buy steel in the United States than there are companies that make steel, uh, but it's weakened us in terms of our ability to uh, craft some sort of uh, multilateral international uh, campaign that we could use to try to force China uh, to uh, alter its, uh, its damaging uh, policies. Hmm. Uh, you just awakened a memory in my life. When I worked in the financial business, I was sitting in a cafe in Paris. And this is in the early 90s. And a gentleman walked out and spoke to me in French, which I didn't master at all. And I said, may I speak in English? He says, oh, he says, the whole world, it has to learn English. And I, and I said, yeah. Uh, he said, well, because it's either that or learning Japanese. And I, and I kind of shook my head, and he says, Sir, the United Kingdom, particularly its northeast, is an aircraft carrier, and they launch cars off the deck of that aircraft carrier, and they're destroying the auto industry in France, and we're all learning huh. English to watch it happen. And it's huh. not that important to me to get a cheaper car that's made in right. the UK. And it reminded me of your, uh, of your trip during Brexit. These were the other side saying right, right. Uh, that they were he i mean this guy's working in a cafe he probably could have got a nice car for cheaper but the social disruption the coherence was not evident to him of a global hmm. division of labor system because the displacements the adjustments the suffering possibly of friends and family was so profound well, the trade i guess i i mean i argue in the book that trade actually is an area where there are a lot of win-wins i mean there are always yeah, going oh yeah. to be some some there can be there can be with adjustment assistance with. there can right. be that's right i mean in the nordics for instance uh i mean i i've been struck whenever i go to the nordics uh labor unions there they're very powerful and they tend not yes. to be against change. I mean, they don't fear automation. Yeah. They'll, they'll say, That's... well, if this makes our employers more competitive, they'll be more profitable. And they their lived experience, contrary to the conversation we've been having, is if my employer makes more money, I'm going to get more money. So I'm yeah. for it. And if I, the job I remember I'm doing doesn't work out. You wrote an article in the New York Times in January of 2019 about we love the robots. And yeah, uh, right. I went, Leif Progrotsky, who was the U.S. counsel from Sweden at the time in New York, had me over for a lunch, and he was reading from your article about exactly oh, that notion. And uh, huh. so, That's great so, it, so there are, how would I say, there's a lot to be explored. At times, there's great complexity. But in an absence of trust... And with the people you call Davos, man, thinking they can get away with things, it's not in, it's not repairing or enhancing trust. And with right. the concentration of wealth, I'll never forget the portion of your book where you describe how the COVID vax system of COVAX right. was a smaller amount of money than the individual money that Jeff Bezos could put into his spaceship system right. or endeavor, not necessarily his physical structure but but right. the idea that the whole planet had less money for taking care of the pandemic than he had to build his own personal space program does illustrate what you might call the pressures that the common good must feel let me finish one last question people sure. like gabriel zuckman and uh, emmanuel Saez, thomas piketty and others are talking about a global wealth tax Right. Do you do you see that as helpful, viable, a step in the process of counteracting the kind of maladies that you've described in your book? I mean, we have to have some kind of wealth tax. Uh, what, whether you administer it globally or whether you do it nationally, I mean, there's a lot to debate there. There has to be some kind of wealth tax for the simple reason that wealth is where the money is. I mean, Jeff Bezos makes... About eighty-three thousand dollars a year. That's his income. So if we live on income taxes, Jeff Bezos is going to pay income taxes that are about equivalent to what an elementary school teacher in California pays. 
Uh, that's just absurd. I mean, Jeff Bezos' wealth is tied up in, in, in the stock of Amazon. Uh, most of us can't get away with evading taxes. The taxes are a fairly simple calculation. If we own a home, the property taxes are part of our escrow. Right. Everybody can see them. They're clearly calculated. We work for an employer. The employer withholds our taxes, and then we file to maybe get some up and back or pay more, you know, whatever. It's, it's all very transparent. There's not much we can do. The, the Davos man has billions of ways to evade taxes. Davos man has arsenals of, of lobbyists who are finding new ways to exploit the tax code that exists and rewrite the tax code further toward uh, his advantage. The only way that we're going to deal uh, with the redistribution that has to happen. I mean, I mean, let, let's step back just for an American context. I've heard it said, and, and I subscribe to this view, that the single that the thing that really distinguishes the United States from every other developed democracy is that we don't force wealthy people to pay taxes. And so as a result of that, our tax collections are meager. And it's it's worse than that, by the way. Davos man's lobbyists make it impossible to even finance the IRS. So the IRS doesn't even have enough people to do their job. We're leaving uh, tens to hundreds of billions of dollars on the table uh, just there. So when we then have conversations where ordinary people, people who even consider themselves progressive, will say, well, you know, it'd be nice to have health care, but we can't afford it. It'd be nice to do more for people who, who can't afford to send their kids to college. But who's going to pay for it? Mm-hmm. Who's going to pay for it? The people who pay for it in, in other societies that don't seem to struggle over uh, how to provide health care and housing and education. That's Davos, man. And the wealth tax is is the way you do that because that's where the money is. Very good. Well, Peter, this is an extraordinary uh, book that you've written. It's Thank a very, you. very substantial challenge or a, a wake up call to explore how we organize, what we legitimate, what we pretend is legitimate, but don't really say raise the hood and look in at the at the engine. And I think that this is a debate that has to happen, because if it doesn't happen, the democratic process, which you describe in your conclusion, will wither.